For the majority of children who live in Southeast Asia, this is a wonderful place to grow up, a place where hopes and dreams can come true. childhood dreams. What did you want to be when you grew up? A dream. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's so simple. Uh, I want to be a, a teacher. Uh, yun yung um, ano ko, gusto ko talaga maging police pagtapos ng pag-aaral. Mayaman. <laughs> maging mayaman po. <laughs> para sa, hindi sa sarili ko po, para sa buong pamilya ko po. Ito <laughs> pa. Well, when she was growing up, as a little girl, what did she dream of becoming? Cut face when I go, Kana. Cut chung, how long jam yay. Chum, can I talk? Mira, you can ban her chung for me to be. Hang chung cut fat. For the majority of girls, Southeast Asia is a place where dreams can come true. Yet for a growing minority of Asian girls, their dreams are being turned into nightmares. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. We're in Bangkok. See, drunk off in the club, everything spinning. Bunch of freaky girls, sweating and grinning. Come over here, mama, let me see you move. Show me what you're working with, show me what it do. Let me get a little taste of your freak show. This is Pattaya, believed to be the sex capital of Thailand, but also the world. It has over 20,000 bottles in this one city alone. Mama, take it home for a little strip show, mama. We gon' try things that you never did yet. Off more purple than the whole dip set. Shawty putting in the bed for a rubber dub. Taking me to ecstasy. Did you know what? Prostitution is illegal in Thailand. This is Angeli, the sex capital of the Philippines. There are approximately 12,000 girls in this area working in prostitution. That's a lot, and apparently it's growing in number. By the way, prostitution is illegal in the Philippines. A conservative estimate would place the number of prostitutes in Southeast Asia at approximately 4 million men, women and children. We are not talking about people working out of the spare room of their house. This is a billion dollar money-making machine. When we look at what some people call 
the commercial sex industry. Um, and there's all sorts of debates about whether that's an appropriate term to call it. Um, I think it probably is because unfortunately it has reached the level that it is commercial. Okay, one third of the annual revenue generated by the government, local government here, uh, according to the ILO, is through sex tourism alone. As with all businesses, the commercial sex industry is a combination of supply and demand. And so while the demand comes from active local and international clientele, what about the supply? Where do the brothels of Southeast Asia find the four million people, particularly girls, ready and willing to take up a career in prostitution? Do you really think that we dream of becoming a prostitute? This is something that we wake up one day and say, hmm, when I grow up, I want to be a prostitute. I want to degrade myself and have men rape me and spit on me. Are you kidding me? So if no person ever grows up dreaming of being a prostitute, then there must be some powerful dynamics involved in recruiting so many of them. People often wonder in a situation in Southeast Asia how people can uh, sell their children and how people can do terrible, terrible things like that. But you come here and you see the poverty and it changes everything. So this, this bridge here is, is going directly over open and raw sewage. You can, you can smell it, you can see it. Um, and, and a couple of local stories says uh, at least one child has fallen in there and drowned. As it is all over the world, Poverty in Southeast Asia is significantly influenced by ethnicity, as our team discovered when Tony Kerwin of Destiny Rescue introduced them to the marginalised hill tribes of Thailand. There's lots of um, different ethnic groups here um, that have travelled across the borders from the neighbouring countries like Burma and Laos and Cambodia and even through from China. We do a lot of um, uh, rescue work here up in northern Thailand and then down in Pattaya and Bangkok and so far ev every girl that I've come across is from a hill tribe. Haven't come across one Thai girl so far. As the girls of the poor hill tribes are denied Thai citizenship there are very few options for making a living. And yet still hundreds and thousands of girls from the poorer nations of Laos, Cambodia and Burma are lured into Thailand each year by sex traffickers to share the same fate as those before them. So what we're looking at here is a bridge between Thailand and Burma, AKA Myanmar. The sex trafficking on this border is significant. Now we've got children, beggars, we see running across this bridge all the time. Apparently at night, they can be used for all kinds of um, sexual exploits. Another significant factor involved in those vulnerable to sex trafficking is the breakdown of the family. As a former mama son, we were trained to hunt these girls and what to look for. We had to look for their vulnerability. We had to look for their dysfunctional family. Um, my family background is broken family, um, victim of incest and rape by my stepfather. The women coming into prostitution um, tend to be, or the majority of the time, come from very impoverished uh, families. Uh, a, lot, a lot come from broken families, the, the violence has been experienced, 
various levels of abuse in childhood has also been found um, in, in multiple studies. <laughs> It is easy for many traffickers to identify damaged girls from damaged families because the traffickers often live in the community. So they can be neighbours, friends and sometimes family members, sometimes even parents. Selling a child is the easiest way to make money. Uh, a bag of drugs lasts one time. A little body lasts many, many, many years. And much profit can be taken from that. Um, a lot of the families, they see that as a normal out to poverty. I need to send my other son to school so my daughter, she gets sold. Or I need a piece of land for future needs of my family so this child gets to be the one that goes to the brothel. What you are seeing here is footage from a typical brothel in Burma whose girls are trying to be sold to our undercover team. Unbelievably, the girls often willingly submit to their parents' desire to enter the sex industry and thus meet an expectation that runs deep in Southeast Asian culture. Uh, whatever the parents do or whatever the parents tell the children to do, they will do it. If uh, my family has a need, it's honorable for me to give myself to this type of life so that the rest of my family can survive. The commercial sex industry gets their supply by manipulating the poorest, most marginalised and vulnerable members in Southeast Asia. They do this so the brothel owners can line their pockets with money of lust-driven men. But in this $32 billion a year industry, who is paying the highest cost? The team is about to find out. Mike, Mike, this uh, undercover watch thingy, camera, how do I know it's red or blue that time? I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Jason has donned the camera and is heading to the clubs in the notorious Pat Fong district in Bangkok to see Tony Kerwin of Destiny Rescue at work. We um, have teams of guys that are going into the brothels, um, sometimes following direct leads. We will pose as a customer. I think sometimes you have to pretend to be the devil to rescue an angel. And there are so many devils in Southeast Asia. Primary customers within these bars are Australian, American, Korean uh, and Northern Europeans. The East Asian sex tourists, the Koreans, they tend to come in groups and you can see them like on a Friday night in their bus loads coming in, like on a package tour. The others, um, like Australians, Europeans, Americans, a ho ho whole range really. You get individuals coming on their own. Um, some of these guys um, have had difficult lives, some have had broken marriages, some are divorced. Some are young backpackers, groups of Australians and Americans who do come here and they tend to be work pals or teams that are touring Southeast Asia, sports teams, not famous ones, you know, like local sort of sports teams, rugby teams, who are touring and playing, I don't know, rugby sevens or whatever, cricket. But the foreign import extends past simply being customers. When we're looking at the sex bars, um, the foreign sex bars here in Anglis, um, the owners, and I have, to, I have to break this down more clearly, 
the owners, not legal owners, but the real owners are foreigners. It is a foreigner that runs it and owns it. Since we've been here, we've heard lots of rumours that is the Russian Mafia that runs a lot of the brothels here in Thailand and also in Cambodia. And tonight we've seen that firsthand. We've seen the strongest evidence of that in a club just down the road from here. Now in that club are only European girls. The Eastern Bloc countries are notorious now for becoming a real traffic highway. And it's found its way here into Thailand as well. And they're very, very dangerous stuff. So Jason and the Destiny Rescue team enter this dangerous world pretending to be sex tourists. The team are quickly confronted by the lineup of girls on stage. Their general appearance differ from girl to girl, but for a majority of them, a dark inner struggle takes place. Neon lights flashing. And we walk in. The music gets louder. And we step up on stage. Don't cry, don't cry. You have to be tough. You gotta let mom and dad be proud of you. It's all for honor. I try to look for that one strobe light. And I can just blind myself in so I don't have to see reality. Even after rationalizing it in our heads, it doesn't take away the fear. You see the dancers line up on stage, but behind the makeup are the tears. May stage nag sayang po kami. May may sayaw tapos sila ang customer at saka yung babaeng uh, tinable doon mismo na ano. Tapos doon mismo po nag uh, iba-iba hindi lang naman po isang or dalawang magpartner lang po yung But while the team is surrounded by dancing girls, the first people they meet are the middle-aged women, commonly referred to in the West as a pimp but in Southeast Asia as Mama Sun. The Mama Sun is like a foreman who patrols the brothels and oversees the girls to ensure everything goes according to plan. Most of the Mama Suns are also prostitu prostituted women before. Now they grow older, so they, they become the Mama Sun of the younger generation. Can you please share with us what you do? Kami yung naghanap ng customer, tapos tinuturo lang namin yung mga girls. Do you like this? Yung ganyan. Tapos kami yung nagpipresyo. Ito yung 500, 300. Pinahatid, siyempre kasi ipamani down. Kami yung mga bugaw ang upamani down. Kasi naabangan yung pato. Hmm. Tapos kami yung nagbibinta ng mundo. Do the girls like you? <laughs> For the girls, their relationship to the Mama Sons range from being a second mother to a prison warden. But for the team to be able to maintain their facade, the Mama Son is the one they have to convince. On arrival, the Mama Sun is quick to ensure that each person has a drink and that each customer has a female companion. So picking girls varies from bottle to bottle. Um, in the case of the bar we just came from, we just had to pick the girls that were up on stage and they would come down to us. They're looking up and down at us. They tell the girl, turn around, turn side to side, lift up your chest. Let me see if they're real. As if the girls aren't even good enough to be on the lineup. So this other brothel we went to, I had the girls on stage in their bikinis, except this time they had numbers. So what would happen is the customer would go to the mama son and they would say, I want that one there. And then they'd get that, you know, those red laser things and point it at the girls. You know, just, oh, I'll have that one there, or that one there. Some of them lick their lips as if 
for some pork chop or beef. But by far the worst thing that we've seen in any of these clubs happened in one dance floor where the 30 or 40 girls were dancing there. And uh, from the roof, these Asian men started throwing down notes, money, and the girls just went crazy and acting like wild animals are fighting and screaming. And everyone just burst out laughing, all these guys and laughing at the girls. And just, yeah, great entertainment, you know? And we feel disgusted and berated inside. Now each team member must choose a girl. Destiny Rescue's mission means they must choose a girl under 18. Once the girls sit with the men, the mama son quickly ensures they buy the girls a drink too. Drinks are important. To maintain their cover, the team need to keep spending money, and the easiest way to do that is to buy drinks. If they stop buying drinks, then they stop spending money and will quickly draw unwanted attention. The girls that the team chooses immediately show them affection and the games begin. And I can tell you one thing, some of these girls are not backwards and coming forwards. When we're sitting next to the customers, we play our part. We bat our eyes, we giggle, we cover our mouth and smile. We'll talk softly and we'll say, so you like? He's like, oh yeah. It's a really weird experience, because on one hand, they're very in your face and quite intrusive. But on the other hand, you get sucked in, because the girls are really, really charming. He has no clue. I don't care about you. I don't care about what you look like. So it's all a play of seduction. If you look at the girls closely, when they don't think you're looking at them, and the mama sons are not around, You'll see this really glazed look in their eyes. Like, they're not even there. And they're not even enjoying the experience at all. But then, they'll see you looking at them, or the mama son will come back in, and snap, they sh straight back into character again, straight back into the seduction. But while the team is supposed to be playing the role of sex tourists, they cannot indulge in such games. They have a different agenda for the girls. It doesn't take very long for us to stand out as being very different. Um, you can, within a short time, the girls are very relaxed um, because they, they have noticed that we don't touch them bad, we don't speak down to them, um, we uh, try and make it light and fun. Um, and you know, if there's other guys in, in the same brothel with girls, you can see the body language of the other girls are very protective of themselves because the guys are often going for the grope and then trying to get them into the rooms. So they do start to trust you quite quickly. On this night, Tony meets an underage dancer named Anne. Her lively dancing suggests she is new to club life. Tony's non-physical and respectful approach to Anne quickly allows a good relationship to form. On seeing this, the mama's sons continually ask Tony if he wants to take Anne to a private room. Sex is the most expensive and therefore most desirable outcome for the club. Much to Anne's relief, Tony declines to the end. On leaving, the team says they will return. But when they do, it will be Tony making an offer to Anne. By the time the bar closes, the team have left the girls with good money through the drinks and generous tips, and an evening without them worrying about any untoward sexual activity. The girls have had a surprisingly good night. But for many other sex workers out there, this night will become a nightmare. When meeting with these customers, once they enter the room alone, all bets are off. There is no safety net. There is no monitors. There is no bodyguards to hear her screams. At that point, these customers really believe they have the right to abuse, sodomize, rape, strangulate these girls, and even murder. Pera nila eh, kasi once na 
binayaran ka nila, automatic yun na sinasabi nila na gagawin ko kung anong gusto ko dahil binayaran kita. Tayo natin yun ang natin na eh. Tayo piyop, tayop siya ang kaway, yop yung kaya yung binyay, tayo yung mutak mo siya yun. Tayo yung matang tayo mutak ng ay mati eh. Tayo yung mutak. Muta hai ngom ke awi pat teko je ma teko nang nyok dang tham ma je pe ngom pak ta ngom do mia rong tha siu sa siu ai chang ma hai nyok dang klu ne pe ta ngom chư pe nang ngom chạm tan pu ai ngom bat bong chang ma ta hai bu thai bu ta kan ke nyok dang tha ta na dai ai dang tha ta na hai pu ai ngom May mga maybe noon na ginagamitan nila ng bote ng ano, beer kapag ka hindi nila, hindi sila... Beer? Susok sa? Opo, papasok sa ano. Okay, baka ako nyong dahil tuwa away, dahil nyong mag-chang tuwa. Kê bà khóm thơ bạp nhóm đài nhóm chư chạp Đấy rồi nhóm Đấy đài nhóm ọt Chư chạp đài kê thơ bạp nhóm đại nhung mình thơ tam kê kê bậc khom nhung mọi thơ đại nhung mọi thời ban mau bị nhung mọi sợ che đang ọt nên chậm này How many clients would you service in a night? Wouldn't that be too much? Surely that would make you physically sick. But for the girls, physical abuse is only just the start of the suffering. What our research shows is very significant when we talk about mental health disorders among women in bar-based establishments, you will find significant, statistically significant levels of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, low levels of self-esteem. So most of the girls they have the problem with self-esteem. They don't know themselves, they don't know how to love themselves. with someone, they will take some sharp thing and cut themselves, and the blood will come out. And some girls, they don't know that, they just think that it's my fault. My body is so dirty, I don't love my body. And some girls, they feel disappointed, they have no hope anymore. And some girls very, very quiet, they don't want to say anything. As a trained counsellor, Dummy has committed herself to renewing the lives of sex trafficking survivors. When the girl first comes with me, most of the time I let the girl to draw the picture. And while Dummy gains much satisfaction from the lives she sees changed, it continually breaks her heart to see her fellow Cambodian girls suffer. The girl cry, the girl sad, and when we see that, we, we will feel the same things. It's very hard should them to be like that. If I can't change, I will arrest all the people to stay in the jail because they are too bad. They shouldn't do that with the girl. There is no worse example of life destroyed than the story of Glenda. A story so bad that even Marlene, our experienced social worker and our interpreter, could not believe it. Five years old, she was five years 
So, uh, what was it like? Hindi po namin alam kasi nakakulong po pa na sa kwarto. Ano, lagi, hindi kami makalabas, nakalak. Binibigyan lang kami, parang may, may ganyan lang kalak na pwede daan yung pagkain. Binibigyan kami ng isang erinola. If the customer uh, is interested in her, the door will be open and the customer can come in. Sa tingin mo, nung mga panahon na sa kasa ka, sa isang linggo, ilan ang customer mo? Marami. Uh, nakulong ako mula lima hanggang 13 years old ka sa kasa. You locked up sex life for eight years. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what to ask. Um, well, what happened next, Kaila? Ang uh, sakla pa, nung na-raid yung kasa, kinuha ko ng barangay. Tapos, yun nga, uh, kin kinabukasan pumunta yung mama ko dun sa barangay para kunin ako ulit. Uh, hindi ko alam na nandun yung chewing ko, tapos yung nang tito ko. Ayan, kinandado niya ako, tapos nire-rip niya ako. She was showing us her scar. Yeah, and this one. Dalawang taon yata ako kinulong sa buwan. Na mm -hmm. Namamaga ako. So 13 ka hanggang 15? Um, 15 years old ako. Nabuntis ako dun si Chowin ko. Tapos alam ng mama ko, hindi lang naman niya ako tinutulungan. Galinda eventually escaped her family and found herself alone and poor on the streets. And mayroon sa akin lumapit na hindi ko naman alam na bugaw yun. Sumama naman ako doon sa babae. Sabi ko pagkakainin niya ako. Tapos ngayon, hindi ko alam. Ang parting pala yung dadalan sa akin, mayroon pala doon kung sumiro o binunggaw ako. Sounds like a story curing right there. Oo, oh, gano'n na. Kasi, uh, ano, madumi. Parang hindi ko na kilala yung sarili ko. To tell ka ako, nakikinabang sila sa akin, bakit hindi ko nalang gawin? Now 28 years old, Glenda can be seen working the streets of Manila with her three children in tow. It is very essential to get these girls out before the year is over. The longer she stays in, the longer the brainwash takes effect. But when a child has been used to violence, then she will start to believe she deserves it. She will start to believe that is the norm. And so the longer that she stays, that she will start to accept it as part of her life. This is our second night in Bangkok. Last night we went down to a couple of clubs and pubs and made some contact with some girls. We found one particular club had a lot of really young ones and we made a really good uh, impact there. We met some of them and got on with them really well. Now for the second stage is to follow up that contact with more positive contact and hopefully tonight put before them an offer to actually take up another job and leave the stripping prostitution industry. So it's, it's, this is kind of where it really matters now. So the stakes are pretty big, and I'm pretty excited. I hope it works. All of our guys, we're passionate about getting these kids out. Um, we are prepared to die for this. I just know that if it was one of my girls, I'd do anything. <clears throat> and um, if it was one of your kids, how far would you want me to push? Um, when is... <clears throat> When's too far? When, what's, what wouldn't you be willing to do to get your girls out? Tonight that girl is 17-year-old Anne. This is only Anne's second night at the club. Before she could remember, Anne was living with her grandparents in Bangkok. 
At the age of five, she witnessed her grandfather die of illness. This convinces her to become a nurse. But after a year of tertiary education, the lack of finance means she starts part-time work at brothels. But balancing study, working and providing for her grandma is proving too much, and slowly but surely, working at the brothel is consuming her life. Tony and Destiny Rescue are there tonight to turn this around. On arrival to the bar, Anne enthusiastically greets Tony. After a few drinks, Tony pays the bar fine to take her off the premises and away from the prying eyes of the mama son and the management. Tony meets up with his Thai translator and he and the team go to a dinner at a restaurant close to her club without being in direct sight of it. Once dinner is served, Tony explains his real intentions. I'm actually going to be working there for two days, but I think after a while, uh, mm -hmm. He wants to offer Anne a chance to escape the sex trade and join Destiny Rescue. Anne has been offered to go to a Destiny Rescue home in Thailand where she'll receive accommodation, food, medical cover, trauma rehabilitation for a time in the sex industry and vocational training. Darkness fades to gold whenever you are near your world. So once we've got that trust and we've, we've put it out there why we're really there, um, I mean, I'm just, I'm just hanging on a yes. And um, I don't know, it's just like you, you build it up to this climax and and you're just wanting her to say, yes, I want to go. So if she wants to even just come and have a look, we can wait for her and her grandmother to come up and have a look. Anne listens quietly and attentively to this offer. And then... Five minutes, back, five minutes. Then all of a sudden, bam, from nowhere, this lady comes up, takes Anne, takes her to the corner. We're just sitting there clueless. And I thought, that's it. Game over, we're busted. This lady is one of Anne's mama sons from the previous bar. She must have heard our conversation. She offers Anne even more money to return back to her ex-club. It's good money for her and her grandma. Why don't they just walk away? Are you kidding me? Do you really think that they would throw away all that investment? These girls are a product to them. They are not going to lose out on billions of dollars knowing that these girls can help them make that. I think we've blown it. I honestly think that this rescue's failed. I hate to say. The sex industry, it seems, will not give up Anne without a fight. There are many ways in which to keep the girls enslaved, like the use of drugs. We've had two clients last year where that happened, and unfortunately they were trafficked into forced prostitution. So they were held in a house, a holding house. Uh, they were drugged. The drugs uh, ensure that they um, basically awake uh, 24 hours a day. It stopped them menstruating, so they wouldn't have whatever four, five, six days a month where they couldn't uh, have, have people coming in to have sex with them. Um, and also drugged to control them. If you're drugged, you can't escape, you can't fight back. Hi. Mama sons and brothel owners use cultural isolation to create a dependency. Traffickers would go there, entice people there to bring their children, especially the, the women, back here in, in, in the city. And when they are there, they cannot just get out because they don't know where to go. And they cannot speak. Some of these women cannot speak the language, the dialect that we are speaking here in Manila. So they have to use an interpreter. The inter interpreter was the trafficker. So he can do anything to the women. Many girls are not entrapped by traffickers or mama-sons, but by their loyalty to family. Choice ko na pwede kong 
masakit kasi pagarap para sa akin para ko sa mga ganyan pero kinaya ko yun tsaka ako kasi iniisip ko yung pamilya ko yung patuloy na ko I don't like this but I need money so I go there yeah I do this for my children to support everything I did Ang gusto ko kasi makapagan, pagpaaral ko ng tatlo ko na lang. Yun lang, kung hindi man ako nakapag-aaral, yung tatlo na lang. Uh, ayoko naman silang magutong. So what became of your childhood dreams when you worked in a brothel? Yung katang chikili. Sa buwan na bako, magic kapot, pigatayo ate. Ah, so think that it's fun. I want to be a teacher, but uh, I cannot reach <laughs> because I don't have I don't have money to to uh, to provide my my needed. Wala na nabuuan, wala lahat ng pangarap ko kasi siyempre. Nakakulong ka na din sa isang kwarto, wala ka ng ibang hinarap, hindi apat na sulit na pala. <laughs> Do you still believe in God? Uh, hindi na ako naniwala kasi nung nangyari sa akin pa ulit-ulit eh. Uh, galit sa kanya, sinisi ko siya kasi lahat mga pangarap ko nawala. It is the girls who have paid the price. These girls have sacrificed their very lives and dreams on the altar of lust and greed. It can be a lifelong curse and with human trafficking becoming the fastest growing criminal activity in the world, anti-trafficking organizations like Destiny Rescue are fighting an uphill battle. How can this money-making juggernaut be stopped from destroying millions of innocent lives? There's a, there's a Jewish, actually a Hebrew saying, you save one life, you save the world entire. Now, it can sound melodramatic, but actually it's kind of true. It is impossible for me to assist every single person in prostitution in, for example, Angry City. I can't do that. Even seeing one success story actually gives you the encouragement to continue, you know? And it's not just one life. You help one person, you help their family, you help their their relatives, you help the next generation. You actually break the cycle of poverty, right? Katie Wallace is a musician and a good example of an individual striving to make a difference. Expressing her passion for the poor through her music has led her to the streets of Manila as she continues to seek out ways to contribute to the struggle against sex trafficking. songs and about very frivolous things when I was in my mid-twenties and thought that I wanted to be a massive rock star um, and that took a major turn when I went to Africa for the first time. Basically went away and in the space of three weeks my entire worldview got shattered. Katie's new worldview has taken her and her band, Remember Seven, 
all over the developing world on a journey of discovery. Observing her passion for helping the poor, Jason invited Katie and her guitarist Joy back to Manila to see how they could continue the work she embarked upon during her first visit one year earlier. Uh, what do these bottles have that is significant to you? Um, these brothels on Commonwealth Avenue, this is the first time I ever experienced what prostitution looked like, what young girls dancing looked like. Western pop culture meeting uh, poverty in this weird, sad, disgusting, dark sort of way. And there's nothing glamorous about this. It's dirty, it's smelly, it's disgusting, and it makes me angry, it makes me sick, and it makes me sad. Uh, it was at this venue that Katie saw a shy young girl named Diane dancing on stage. This experience inspired Katie to write the song Red Lit Stage for the band's latest album. Red lit stage, childlike face, smells of seduction in the air. Ironically, one of the reasons for Katie's return to the club is to film the video clip for Red Lit Stage with Diane. To find ourselves sitting in, in this bar and this brothel where, um, where I had written that song a year earlier, to find us sitting there and hearing, hearing my voice coming over the, the um, crackly speakers and to see Diane dancing, my heart and my prayer is that she would find herself in the same position as the character in that song where, where she would be able to step out of that role, step out of that role that she's been playing and into her new shoes and into her new life and, and to be able to walk away with her head held high and her heart full and, and her dreams maybe more within her reach. New shoes. I met Diane three, four years ago and then uh, she was just a bubbly like teenager who is a happy, she was a happy girl because she was the youngest during the time. Has this industry taken its toll on her? Yes, uh, the industry really has stolen her. I told her, do you really want this job? No, I'm not happy with this job, but I have to be happy because I'm earning for, for my family. We have met with Diane and she has, um, she's expressed interest over a number of years with Marlene to, to do something else. If you could do another job, would you like to do that? Yeah, Diane has has been a been a revelation maybe this week. Meeting her and, and this last few days has almost been like seeing the rebirth of Mary Jane, which is what her birth name is. That that it's almost been seeing the rebirth of of the child that she was born to be. She is, a, she is a beautiful girl and she has captured my heart and my attention and I would hope to be a person that can journey with her. That journey will see Katie and Remember Seven team up with Marlene and her organisation, Focus, in an attempt to rescue Diane and allow her dream to come true, to go back to school. When you start seeing passionate individuals like Katie and Tony step up, then individuals like Diane and Anne have a shot at freedom. But what happens when many individuals step up? The right to end slavery is, is both an awareness and a fundraising campaign. Well, for me personally, I believe every every life matters. That, that's why I'm here in a nutshell. We decided to uh, put away life as normal, you know, <laughs> and uh, take on an adventure. The people that will come on this trip, I'm sure, will go home inspired of what about what they've seen and um, that, that'll empower them to, you know, maybe raise some more funds for the cause, which will result in more children being rescued. And as the support grows, little by little, one by one, 
young lives are being claimed back. What has become of those childhood dreams since you have escaped the sex industry? We have some darling children that you would never know. You would never know the abuse that they've been through. They are the ones that give love to us. When I see these girls, I feel like I'm home. I feel like I've surrounded myself with the brothers and sisters that I once lost. They are the ones that fulfills our dreams, that tells us that we are above what anyone has ever called us and we can accomplish anything we put our minds to. No one would agree with that statement more than Anne, who rejected the offer to work for money at the brothels and joined Destiny Rescue. You see, one person can make a difference in someone's life. An organization can make the change in many lives. But what would happen if normal, everyday people rose up to create a worldwide movement dedicated to tearing down the sex industry. It's going to take an army of people to be bold enough and brave enough to walk away from complacency in their own lives. It's going to take more than one band and it's going to take more than two guys with a dream of making a documentary. It's going to take an army of people. So if everyone could say, what is my part? What am I supposed to do? Is it supporting somebody else? Is it actually going out there and doing the raids and rescues? Is it helping those that come out and are making things and buying and, and, and helping the industries that are being created? Uh, is it helping educate a child? Um, I think if every one of us do our part and not just wait for someone else to do it or the big organizations to do it, I think we can change the world. <laughs> Everybody can do something. You, you're making a, a decision. You're, you're either deciding, I'm going to do nothing, or you're going to do something. I would hope that there is no part of the human heart that can't open up and find compassion, and, and find compassion that leads to action. I would hope that that's not the case. Um, but. People know. People see things on the news every day.
Peace can be found.